Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Great Decisions event on Red Sea Security. Today's speaker, Professor Andrew Latham of McAllister, lists scholarly interests in the area of international relations and political thought. His most recent publication is Theorizing Medieval Geopolitics, War and World Order in the Age of the Crusades, but he also teaches courses on conflict and security in the contemporary Middle East. This program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, the Foreign Affairs Association, and Global Minnesota. We are deeply grateful to all these organizations. The 2020 briefing book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks, is available for purchase through the co-sponsoring, <clears throat> excuse me, through the co-sponsoring organization globalminnesota.org. Because of their generosity, we also have a number of briefing books available for checkout at the library. And now I'd like to turn things over to today's speaker, Andrew Latham. Thank you, Judy, for that uh, very gracious introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, before I begin speaking about the Red Sea, I want to say just a few words about the Red Boutonniere. Um, I grew up in Canada, and at this time of year in Canada, in the run-up to November the 11th for Americans Veterans Day, for Canadians and Brits and Australians and others in the Commonwealth uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, this is a poppy, and it is meant to draw our attention to the sacrifices that were made in the two world wars in particular, uh, but in all the wars that have been fought for um, just causes. Uh, so it's not me trying to make some sartorial statement. It is me trying to remember the sacrifices made by my forebears. Having said that, um, Again, thank you all for being here. My uh, comments today will be very much focused on what I will call the Red Sea security complex. Can't look at the Red Sea or even its littoral states in isolation. We have to put them in a couple of frames that are larger. And so I'm going to depend very much uh, upon uh, the map that I'm gonna share with you in a moment um, and simply walk you through what that security complex that configuration of nations looks like, what the big issues are, which is to say, why do we care about the Red Sea? And then to look at some of the debt dynamics. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've had two classes this morning already, um, feeling just a tad hoarse. Um, what are some of the extra regional dynamics that are impinging upon the security and insecurity of the states and nations in the region? So with that, I'm going to hit the share screen button and hope against hope that it works. And I'm going to assume that it is unless I hear from Greg or Judy that it's not. Yep, it looks Perfect. good. Okay, excellent. Well, let me take you on a bit of a tour d'horizon. Uh, as they say in various foreign ministries of this region. But before we do that, the Red Sea, obviously, and for reasons I'll discuss, an important waterway with important littoral countries, countries on its shores. But as I indicated just a few moments ago, um, it really is important to place this in a frame. And that frame is a security complex frame. And what a security complex is, is uh, a group of nations, a group of states, whose security interests and anxieties are inextricably intertwined. In other words, a group of states for whom you cannot look at state A without thinking about the way in which their security concerns uh, are shaped by or impinged upon by the security concerns of state B and C and D and so on. So it's a complex web of interdependence, interrelationships, mutual vulnerabilities, mutual concerns. And um, our security complex today 
is not centered on the Red Sea so much as bounded by it. If we use the definition that I've just used, the security complex that concerns us today is bounded in the West by Egypt and Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. It is bordered on the Arabian seaside by Yemen and Oman. It is bordered, or includes, I should say, uh, Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iraq, Syria. It includes on the Mediterranean coast, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, including the occupied territories, uh, Gaza and the West Bank, uh, Judea and Samaria, it goes by a variety of names. So that's the chunk of the world that we are most interested in today. And as we'll see in a moment, even though that is the security complex, there are players, there are states, there are actors from beyond that security complex that nevertheless have an impact upon it. I'm gonna treat these as two separate sets of actors. And then I'm going to look a little bit about the dynamics within that security complex and look at the way in which those extra regional actors also have a role to play. Now, one of the reasons I like talking to groups like this is that unlike with my students who are very bright, very earnest, very hardworking, very good, none of them was alive on November the 11th. They, when I make references to things and when I say think back or you might recall or remember when, for the most part, they don't. But with an audience like this, I can assume that your memory is at least as lengthy as mine. And so I ask you to think back over the last 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years. When we look at this map and we think of the Middle East, which is really the heart of this Red Sea security complex, I imagine that the first thing that comes to mind is the conflict between Israel and its Arab neighbors, or since the late 1990s, it's often been framed as the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And again, thinking back to that conflict, it has always been latent. That is to say, just below the surface. From the moment the state of Israel was created in 1948, and indeed even before then, the presence of a Jewish state in a part of the world which is predominantly ethnically Arab and religiously Muslim, although there are large Christian and Jewish uh, communities there, um, has been a source of conflict from the moment Israel declared independence in 1948. It was subject to invasion by its neighbors, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, <clears throat> with support from Iraq and at times Saudi Arabia. Israel won that war and became independent, but uh, displaced an awful lot of the people who had been living there before Israel became a state, uh, Palestinians who were dispersed throughout the Arab world and indeed beyond the Arab world. There are Palestinian communities around the globe um, but most remain uh, in this part of the world. And then we fast forward to 1956, Gamal Abdel Nasser, an Egyptian secular nationalist who um, nationalizes the Suez Canal. Now, which prompted, of course, the British and the French who owned the Suez Canal and who had built the Suez Canal um, to mount an invasion. Israel participated in that on the British and French side. And then we fast forward to 1967, the so-called Six Day War. And we fast forward again to 1973. Uh, we have the Yom Kippur War. And we, that's my dog, if you can hear him barking in the background. And then we fast forward again to 
to 1980-81, and we have a conflict between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization in Lebanon. And that conflict between Israel and the Palestinians and or its Arab neighbors has largely defined our geopolitical imagination. When we think of that part of the world, for the most part, North Americans, Western Europeans immediately go there. That's the driver. Uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry said several years ago, he's since been proven wrong, and I'll tell you why a little later in this talk, that there could be no peace, no comprehensive peace in the Middle East without addressing the Palestinian issue. And I think, again, in our geopolitical imagination, we look at this map, we think about the words Middle East, think about this Red Sea security complex, and immediately we think of that as the driving dynamic. But as I'm gonna point out briefly, uh, it is no longer, that conflict no longer drives geopolitics in the region. That conflict is no longer at the heart of the uh, geopolitical dynamics within that security complex. But before I get to that very interesting story, I want to back us up just a little bit and ask a question, which I will then promptly answer. Assuming for a moment that we have no family in the region, or that we don't come from the region, why should we care about the region? Why should we as Americans care? Chancellor Bismarck of Prussia slash Germany back in the 19th century, famously said um, in a very different context, that particular conflict is not worth the bones of one Pomeranian grenadier, one Prussian soldier. There are plenty of American bones, metaphorically speaking, buried in the sands in that part of, in this part of the world. Why? Why should we care? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons. One of which has to do with the Red Sea proper. Begins up here at Port Said, ends up here at the so-called Gate of Tears. I think often people look at blue on a map and they think barrier but it's not. The Red Sea is a super highway. It's a super highway along which trade from what used to be called the Far East, East Asia, South Asia, from India and China, Japan, Australia, uh, and many other countries as well. When they are trading with Europe, either selling their goods to Europe or buying goods from Europe, there's only really a few ways in which it can get from point A to point B. One of which is all the way around Africa past the Cape of uh, Good Hope. That's a long trip and it's expensive and it adds to the price of goods. The British and the French built the Suez Canal here to create a shortcut from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea and to the Arabian Ocean, the Arabian Sea rather, the Indian Ocean and to points farther east for the British India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. This is why historically the British had a huge interest in building the Suez Canal, in maintaining troops in what is now Egypt, um, fighting there in two world wars. Uh, to basically to protect the Suez Canal. It's why there was always a British base down in Aden, as long as there was a British empire. It's why we have just off the map here, Diego Garcia, a British base now used by the United States military as well. It's to create or to, to create and then defend a super highway. And then over here we have Gibraltar, and then we have Cyprus, and we have Malta, if you look at all the little bases that the Brits built between Britain and India, you can see that they run through the Mediterranean, down through here, through the Red Sea, through the, the Gate of Tears, and onwards to India. The Red Sea was for the British, and is today now, a commercial superhighway. That's one of the reasons why this region is important. And to complexify, to use um, a term I don't use very often, 
this equation, we can see that there are two major choke points, points at which it is possible through the use, uh, through use of sea mines or naval forces or land-based missiles to choke off that commercial flow along the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and down here at the Gate of Tears. The Suez Canal is governed by international treaty. The government of Egypt is obliged to allow uh, free and unfettered access to all international shipping. Uh, for a while, uh, during the battle days, they did not allow any Israeli flagged vessels or Israeli bound ships, uh, but those days are long gone. The peace treaty between Israel and uh, Egypt. Um, and down here, there are concerns too, and I'll come back to how they've been addressed. But the Red Sea is a commercial superhighway. There are two choke points and the international community backed by the United States has a vested interest in keeping those choke points open and keeping the flow of all kinds of good things between the Mediterranean and ultimately the Indian Ocean and points farther east. There's a second reason though why the Red Sea is important and that is below the Red Sea, there's oil. In the Western world, um, we like to fantasize that a carbon-free world is just around the corner. And in the medium to long run, that may be the case. I think it's a bit of a fabulous tale myself, but um, we'll let history sort that out. What I do know is this, for the moment, for the moment, petrochemicals, hydrocarbons, oil and gas are lucrative and crucially important elements of a flourishing global economy. For poor countries like Sudan and Eritrea, oil is a vitally important, especially for Sudan in that context, a vitally important source of revenue. For countries like Saudi Arabia, it is their only source of revenue. Not only is this <clears throat> waterway a way of getting oil out to the rest of the world, but it is also a source of oil as well. And where there's oil, there's going to be conflict, especially because uh, the way in which some of the claims to the exclusive economic zones overlap inevitably. Is this Egyptian or is it Saudi? And are there islands in play? And it becomes very complicated. But the bottom line is oil and the transit of commercial and petroleum goods through the Red Sea, past and through these two choke points. So that's one reason why this Red Sea security complex should be of interest to everybody. What happens there is going to have a major effect on the global economy. If we flip to the other side, the Northern side of this security complex, we see another body of water. Uh, this is the Persian Gulf. Excuse me just for a moment. And the Persian Gulf <clears throat> is important for two of those three reasons. One of which is it's a source of oil. There are lots of oil wells, um, lots of undersea oil uh, to be had in the Persian Gulf. And of course, it's a major transit route for oil traveling from Kuwait and Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia to the rest of the world, including Japan and China and other major economic players that are dependent on Middle Eastern oil. And here, parenthetically, I would note that now today, the United States is not dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Uh, the United States is energy independent. It does not need anything from this part of the world. And yet, as we will see, it, it still has interests in this part of the world. But for the time being, um, the Persian Gulf, it's of crucial interest to these littoral players, especially those that are trying to export oil. It's of crucial interest to the consumers of that oil, 
especially these days, China, but not exclusively. Um, it simply is a crucially important part of the global political economy. That's reason number two why the region is important. Region number or reason number three would be the presence, and this has been muted in recent years, but it's still an issue, is the problem of Islamist or Salafist uh, terrorism. Um, the failed states of Syria, the quasi -stale failed states of Lebanon and Iraq, um, the state sponsorship of certain kinds of terrorism by Iran, are all problems, not just in the region, but beyond the region as well. Uh, in Europe, in parts of Africa, and in North America as well. Again, higher profile set of concerns with respect to terrorism five or 10 years ago, but it's still a source of concern. So that, in a nutshell, and to start us off, is why this part of the world is inherently important, and that its security dynamics and the security concerns of, its, of, of the states in the region are not just limited to the states of the region. They are global in import and impact. From an American perspective, specifically, Another core interest, it's not just the free flow of goods, not just the free flow of oil, um, which remains important to the United States uh, because the US requires a healthy global economy in order for it to flourish. And a healthy global economy requires the free and secure and inexpensive flow of oil from this part of the world to Europe, to China and elsewhere. Um, but the US has some very specific interests having to do with Israel as well. Uh, American policy in the region is not reducible to oil. Oil is important, but it can't explain everything. Uh, the security of Israel is a concern that is interconnected with oil in complex ways, but more importantly, uh, it, is a, it is an American interest in its own right. The United States has been committed to the state of Israel since it was created by the United Nations as a, as a state in international law in 1948. Um, Harry Truman, the president of the time, was being advised by the smartest and brightest uh, people in the State Department against the backdrop of, of an emerging Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Look, they told him, do we really want to support a couple of million Jews in Israel when we really need 300 million Arabs as our allies against the Soviet Union? We really should not be supporting, they said to President Truman, the creation of this Jewish state. And he basically told them to get lost. The United States was in the aftermath of the Holocaust. The United States was simply going to support the creation of the state of Israel and the United States decisively voted for the creation of that state at the UN and the resolution passed. And uh, Israel has been both a state and an American interest ever since. Uh, for various reasons, they change with the end of the Cold War, but Israel remains a core American interest. Okay. Let me take us back to the beginning of my, my discussion. And I talked about in our collective geopolitical imagination, Israel, the Palestinians, the Israeli-Arab conflict looms large in our, in our uh, worldview, our imagination. And since between 1948 and 1979, that was the driver, even after 1979. Now, why do I say 1979? And here's one of those instances where I can say to this audience, remember back to what happened in 1979? Remember what happened in Iran in 1979? 
Prior to 1979, you will recall, Iran was America's best friend in the Middle East. It was our local law enforcement officer. We used to call it local policeman, but we don't any longer. The Shah, who was in charge of Iran, uh, was a friend of ours. The Shah was modernizing Iran in a very Western way. The Shah was bitterly and vehemently opposed to the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. The Shah was our friend, and as long as the Shah was in power, Iran was our friend. We sold Iran our best military equipment. We gave them some of our best military equipment. And the United States basically subcontracted the security of the Persian Gulf to Iran. Nobody at the time seemed to know that things were a brewing just below the surface in Iran, that not everybody was happy with either the Shah or the direction the Shah was taking Iran, which is in a very secular, democratic and pro-Western direction. And there was a revolution. And the revolution deposed the Shah. Again, I can say with some confidence that you will remember the hostage crisis. And what a big deal that was in 1979. And Iran then flips from being an American friend and ally, indeed America's subcontracted local law enforcement officer in the region to a bitter and committed and ardent foe of the United States. The US now from Tehran's perspective was the great Satan. Iran became a, a, an Islamic theocracy uh, whose identity and interests simply put it fundamentally at odds with the United States. It was a friend, it became an enemy. But that revolution not only put Iran at odds with the United States, it created another set of hostilities, the most important of which was that between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now again, I think in the collective imagination of the West, what's the difference? They're both Muslim countries, it's the Middle East, they both like oil, they're both theocracies. Uh, but you know, what, what's the difference? Well, there's a huge difference. It's a difference that has redefined the entire Red Sea security complex. And the differences are manifold, but they basically boil down to these. Iran is Shia Islam dominated, Saudi Arabia, uh, a Wahhabist Sunni Islamic country. You don't need to know the whole backstory. You don't need to know the theological differences. You don't know, need to know the history of, of uh, uh, power relations between Sunni and Shia. Also, you don't need to, all you need to know is they are, there's a long history of enmity between the two. They don't get along. Um, and there are real hostilities, theological, which translate into political, which translate into geopolitical. There is no love lost between the champion of Shia Islam and the champion of Sunni Islam, which is also the keeper of the holy places, two of the three anyway, Mecca and Medina. There is also ethnic differences. Iranians are Persians, they speak Farsi, they're not Arabs. Saudi Arabia, well, I guess the name kind of gives it away. This is an Arab country. There are historical differences. Um, Iran and, well, I'll bring Turkey into the equation later, but um, the Persian Gulf on both sides, you have an intermixing ethnically, religiously, where you have, these are not two self-contained civilizational countries. Uh, there's a great deal of overlap. There are lots of Shia on this side of the, uh, the Persian Gulf, and there are some Sunni on this side. Okay. So there's a source of friction there that's grounded in history and theology, that's grounded in ethnic differences, and that's grounded in contemporary political realities. That the theocracy here is antithetical 
in its belief system and its aspirations to the theocracy here. Iran sees itself as the natural leader, as the successor to the great Persian empire, which dominated big chunks of this part of the world. It sees itself as the champion of Shia Islam and having a responsibility to export at the point of a gun if necessary. Uh, the kind of theocracy, Shia dominated theocracy that is in place in Iran. Saudi Arabia sees itself as the keeper of the holy places, as the champion of uh, Sunni Islam, as the natural, look at the map, one of the natural, if not the natural hegemonic or predominant power in the region. Again, I would ask you to cast your minds back in a way that my students can't to the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And that Cold War is long gone, sort of. But there's a new Cold War. There are several of them, but for our purposes, there's a Cold War between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And just as the Cold War was fought by the Soviets and the United States in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia, Korea, Vietnam, El Salvador, um, et cetera, so too, these two powers are using proxies to fight their Cold War in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, Terrible civil war in Yemen, basically three parties vying for supremacy. One is allied with Iran, the other with Saudi Arabia, the third trying to navigate some kind of middle path. Iraq, majority Shia, like Iran, but under Saddam Hussein, dominated by the Sunni minority. Um, that obviously has not been the case since 2003. Iraq has been in various stages of falling apart, but there are a lot of powerful pro-Iran factions in Iraq, and Iran has been building its support in Iraq. Syria has fallen apart since the onset of the so-called Arab Spring several years back now. And Syria was dominated too by the Alawites, which are another sect within Islam. Um, and they were backed by Iran. You can see now a pattern, Iran exporting the revolution, coming to dominate all or part of Iraq, coming to dominate all or part of Syria, have being hugely influential with Hamas, which is a Palestinian group in the southern part of Lebanon, which is supported by, sorry, Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran. And then in the Gaza Strip, Palestinian territory, Hamas, also supported by Iran. Iran sees a great Shia arc emerging, which it will dominate and which will allow it to dominate the entire Red Sea security complex. And guess what? Whenever something like that happens in world politics, people, states have a choice. You can either bandwagon, which is get on board with the rising power, or you can counterbalance, which is to put together a coalition of states, maybe even an alliance system designed to prevent that rising power from dominating your neighborhood, your neck of the woods, which is precisely what's happened over the last 20, 25 years. The Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, has come together uh, to cooperate on containing Iran. Now, there are disagreements within the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, and we can certainly talk about those in the question and answer period. They haven't proven fatal, but they have proven po problematic. But the point is fundamentally that none of these countries wants to be dominated by these guys. So they have turned to these guys to help them resist. That is a source of friction. And whenever you have friction in international relations, you have the prospect of war. And war would be a very unfortunate development in a part of the world that is so utterly, a part of the world upon which 
the rest of the world depends for a great deal of its oil and gas. And again, I'll just ask you to cast your memories back to the Reagan administration, the so-called tanker war through here. Um, Iran sank a few tankers, the United States sank the entire Iranian Navy in something called Operation Praying Mantis. Um, that had a number of effects, one of which was it drove the costs of insurance for those tankers through the roof. And of course that, that cost gets passed on to the consumer. So along with a variety of other factors that accounts for some of the spikes in oil prices um, in the aftermath of the Iranian revolution. So um, where are we then in developing this picture? We have a picture of this security complex. Things have changed since 1979. This conflict between Israel and its neighbors is no longer the driving dynamic. This conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia is the driving dynamic. It shapes everything that goes on in the region. How do I know that to be the case? Because, and here, my students actually do recall this because it only happened five minutes ago. Israel has begun to sign treaties normalizing its political relations with Gulf Cooperation Council states, uh, Bahrain and Qatar at the moment, probably Saudi Arabia in the not too distant future. Th I, I say this to my students in, in class and they say, yes, yeah, so what, who cares? But we know, because we can remember that this is unbelievable that these countries would throw the Palestinian people under the bus basically and say, we just don't care anymore. We've got bigger fish, fish to fry. We're scared to death of these guys. Uh, we would like to have the strongest military powers in the region on our side. Uh, Saudi Arabia, yep, we'll take you. And who else? Oh, Israel. Last time we checked, it pretty much always wins its wars. Here's how deep the cooperation between Israel and Saudi Arabia has become. Now, they haven't yet signed a treaty. But I'm told reliably that in Saudi intelligence headquarters in Riyadh, there's a desk. This is their version of the CIA. There's a desk and there's an Israeli Mossad agent sitting at that desk, keeping the Saudis informed what the Israelis are up to and informing um, his Israeli uh, commanding officer uh, sorry, back in, in, uh, in Israel, what's going on in Saudi Arabia. And there's a Saudi officer sitting at a desk in Mossad headquarters in Israel. That is earth shatteringly important news. So not only do we have treaties and we're gonna see more of them. Well, we saw one recently in Sudan between Sudan and uh, Israel as well. We are gonna see a, a, a set of an alliance system involving Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf Cooperation Council states, maybe Iraq, Jordan, and Israel on the same side, cooperating on security issues to the point where they're sharing intelligence assets. I hope you're all shaking your heads in disbelief because it merits that kind of response. Inconceivable 10 years ago, unimaginable 20 years ago, fan fantasy 30 years ago, reality today. Um, that Cold War has like an earthquake shifted tectonic plates in the region. And unfortunately for them, I'm afraid the Palestinians have been left behind in this. Their great patrons in Saudi Arabia have abandoned them, in Egypt have abandoned them, in Jordan have abandoned them. They always had a fraught relationship with Egypt and Jordan anyway. And their new patron is Iran. Because as you all know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's a timeless logic and it's one which has reasserted itself in this Red Sea security complex today. 
So that fundamentally is, is the regional security complex bounded by the Red Sea, Somalia, Iran, and including uh, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, all of this. And that's the driving dynamic is that Cold War. But let me broaden the frame out a little bit um, in at least two ways, maybe three. Because even this security complex cannot be viewed in isolation. There are two other actors, global powers that do not appear on this map, but that in some way should, because they in some way define this map. And one of those obviously is the United States of America. Since the Second World War, the United States has had a vested interest in the region. That has had to do with oil. It has had to do with the Cold War and containing the Soviet Union. It has had to do with protecting and supporting the state of Israel. Um, it even now, and so some of those reasons still pertain, obviously Israel's security is still uh, of relevance. Containment of Iran now is still important. The free flow of oil and gas through here and through here is still important, not because America needs them, but because the global economy upon which America relies and which the United States is committed to sustaining and supporting requires oil transiting through these two bodies of water securely and inexpensively. So the United States retains its military presence. The United States Fifth Fleet is home ported at Bahrain. A United States carrier strike group periodically sails through here to maintain freedom of navigation, to make sure that the Iranians know that there's no messing around here. Periodically, the Iranians do crazy things to close off the Straits of Hormuz, and the United States always reacts forcefully. Right? Again, a source of friction, a game of chicken, if you will, sometimes. Um, Britain's Royal Navy periodically puts in an appearance here, but let's face it, that's not what it used to be. Uh, the United States Navy is, at this moment in any case, is uh, the biggest bad guy on the block. Um, and the United States is so concerned about freedom of navigation and security in this chunk of the world that it, it devotes an entire carrier strike group. That is a powerful, powerful signal. And that is a powerful military force uh, as well. At the other end, we have Djibouti. Djibouti, as far as I can tell, has one thing to sell on the global market, and it's not oil. It is foreign military bases, former French colony. There's still a French military base in Djibouti, home to French, German, and Spanish soldiers. There is a, a Japanese base in Djibouti. There is an American base in Djibouti. There is a Chinese base in Djibouti, the only overseas Chinese base in anybody's memory, certainly since the revolution in 1949. Um, that is a, sig a powerful signal. And that brings us to the other extra regional superpower that is now increasingly beginning to flex its muscles in the region. One way is, to establish a naval base here in Djibouti, ostensibly to support an international counter piracy naval task force. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Somali pirates were hijacking tankers and other ships that were traveling through here. Um, the international community put together a naval force. They pretty much stamped it out. Uh, under cover of that, the Chinese established and negotiated with Djibouti a military base. <laughs> it's right next door to the American one. Um, and even though the piracy problem is largely gone, the Chinese military presence, naval presence has not subsided. It's still there. At the other end here, China, just off the map in Pakistan, China has built a, a major port facility, dual use, both commercial and military. 
called Guadar. Um, China has signed with Iran a strategic partnership treaty that commits both sides. It's not an alliance like NATO, but it's the next best thing. It is committed both to collaborating on security, to co-developing weapons, to doing a lot of things together. China has for a long time relied on, ironically, perhaps, the United States of America to make sure that this that there was a free flow of oil through this part of the world. It was in America's interest, and it still is in America's interest to do so. But China also has an interest in securing for itself access to the oil here, some of which is produced by Iran, some of which will go through, again, at that Gwadar port, um, a pipeline being established through Central Asia uh, to the western part of China. Um, China sees its interests now as being more than just protecting its own coastline, it is flexing its muscles in the Indian Ocean. It has created something called the String of Pearls, which is a set of bases, port facilities, et cetera, that connect China to the Middle East. Right now, the terminus, one of the termini is this port here. The other one is Guadar. And we're gonna see, we have seen increasing Chinese naval activity in the Arabian Sea, maybe the Persian Gulf possibly the Red Sea, and we know periodically even in the Mediterranean. Is this something particularly nefarious? Well, I'm not in the business of judging that. I will say that any great power in China's situation would do exactly the same thing. They have interests. Those interests might be threatened. They're wealthy enough now they can afford to put naval forces uh, on the board, and they've done so. So we have this Cold War shaping the geopolitics of the security complex. We have a broader emerging Cold War between the US and the People's Republic of China that may not be global like it was with the Soviet Union, but certainly spills over into this region. There are two other actors that are off the screen. Uh, one of which is on the screen, literally, uh, Turkey. Now, we like to flagellate ourselves for being imperialists and messing up this whole region. And Lord knows there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, but we shouldn't forget that Turkey for 400 years was the imperial power, so the Ottoman Empire. Controlled all of what is now Turkey for a big chunk of time, almost up to the gates of Vienna, all of what is now Greece, Bulgaria, all of Egypt, parts of the littoral along here, all of Saudi Arabia, not the interior, nobody cared about it, but certainly Mecca and Medina, um, and all through here and along this littoral as well. This was all part of the Ottoman Empire dominated by Greeks, sorry, Turks, um, at the expense of the Arab peoples. Again, I know I can say to this uh, audience, Remember that great movie with Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia, won several Academy Awards back in the day. Um, highly fictionalized and self-serving story about T.E. Lawrence, a British officer, T.E. Lawrence's career, trying to whip up the Arabs, as he called them, whip them up to throw the Turks out, to flip this part of the world from the Turkish Empire into the orbit of the British and French Empire. There were a number of other deals that were done, Sykes, Pico and whatnot, um, that got the British and the French involved. They were only involved for about 50 years. The Turkish Ottoman Empire was around for a good 400 years. Um, that's all ancient history, right? It's dead, it's finished. There hasn't been an Ottoman Empire since 1922 when the British and French dismantled it. There was a revolution in Turkey. Uh, Turkey became a secular democratic republic. Some of you will have heard the name Ataturk. If you've ever been to Turkey, not in the last 12 years, but before that, you will know that, it, I mean, they changed their alphabet. They adopted a, a, a Roman alphabet uh, like the rest of Europe. Um, they, tr they, having lost the First World War, they decided, they looked at themselves, why did we lose? We're not European enough. How do we fix it? We're gonna become very European. We're gonna put Islam in a box. We are going to ban certain kinds of dress. We're going to ban mustaches. We're going to ban all kinds of things. We're going to change the alphabet. We're going to become just like the Europeans. And when we do, well, that 
has come full circle. The current president Erdogan is, uh, has been referred to by some observers as a neo-Ottoman. He sees Turkey as having, not creating a formal empire, but being very, very influential throughout the former Ottoman lands. There's now a Turkish naval presence down here. Turkey has, is supporting one of the factions in the Yemeni civil war. Turkey has real, under Erdogan, has real ambitions and aspirations, again, not to create a formal empire, but to be a big player in the region. So it is inserting itself into the politics of this security complex, not to mention the conflict that's going on between Azerbaijan and Armenia at the moment. And the other extra regional player, which barely makes it onto this map, is our friends in Russia. During the Cold War, well, at the height of the Soviet Union, of course, all of this was part of the Soviet Union. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, all the stands, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And even before the Soviet Union, you can see the history of Russian imperial expansion from Russia being proper up here through this entire region, right? Bumping finally up against the Persian Empire, which then morphed into Iran. Um, in fact, during the Second World War, occupying half of Iran. Um, and of course, the Soviets were interested in extending their influence throughout the Arab world. So you had very pro-Soviet um, states in Iraq and at one time before 1973 in Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. Russia feels like, and President Putin, who appears to be ill now and may well be retiring, but as, a, as a, uh, an avatar of the Russian national spirit, if we can get so metaphysical, very much sees Russia as a big boy, as a real player on the global stage, and therefore having a legitimate right to be involved in this region. And so we see Russian forces, we see a Russian naval base at Tartus here in Syria, a vestige of the Cold War to some extent, but the Cold War went away and the Russian base in Syria didn't. And Russia playing a role in the Syrian civil war, right? Um, so Russia is also a player, an extra regional player. And that gives us Russia, Turkey, the United States and the People's Republic of China superimpose that on what's going on in terms of the great game, as it's sometimes called, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and you superimpose that on the troubles within Yemen. Um, over here, the national government in Eritrea has attacked one of its provinces. Um, I'm not sure specifically what the dynamic there is, but we know there's an internal uh, that all of the internal troubles, Sudan and Somalia and Eritrea and, and on and on, um, superimposed on those and they're very real. The Palestinian problem is the regional Cold War and superimposed upon that is this other great power game involving these four, two superpowers and two less super, maybe just great powers. So um, in just about an hour. Uh, that is your tour of the Red Sea security complex, focused very much on international conflict and security, um, but with a little bit of political economy thrown in for good measure. And Judy, over to you. Okay. okay. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, that talk. Now it is the turn of the audience. I see that we already have some questions, but there is plenty of time for more questions. So if you uh, do have a question uh, for Professor Latham, type it into the Q&A column and I will start to read them right now. And the first question, if this hadn't been uh, entered by one of the audience, I was gonna ask it myself. Um, the question is the one that's in everybody's mind, I guess. Will the current security alliances continue and increase during a possible Biden administration? Somehow I suspected there might be a question along those lines. Uh, that's just a guess on my part. 
Here's, here's, here's the question. If you accept the premise that personnel equal policy, right? That it's the people you put in charge of the important, your, your secretary of state, your secretary of defense, your national security advisor, et cetera, that you then can predict the policy. Well, a Biden administration is likely to look very similar to an Obama administration when it comes to foreign policy. People like Susan Rice, for example. Um, and the, the, the view of the Obama administration with respect to Iran was this. Look, that part of the world has been nothing but trouble for the United States. Uh, the Saudis aren't really, they're not really like us. It's a theocracy. Um, we have no natural sort of, we don't need their oil anymore. We don't really need them. Um, why don't we reassure Iran? It's premised on a belief that Iran does what it does because it feels insecure. It feels like the US is out to get it. So why don't we reassure them a little bit? Why don't we be a little less confrontational? Why don't we do a deal with them called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA? You'll see it. It's going to come back because it's part of Biden's uh, election platform. And the JCPOA was basically Iran aspires to have nuclear weapons. The United States does not want Iran to have nuclear weapons. The United States put a lot of sanctions on Iran to squeeze them, right, to, to put their arm behind their back, as it were, and keep pushing until they cried uncle. And the Obama administration judged that this wasn't working. It was premised on a false set of beliefs that you could coerce Iran. And that a better way would be to say, let's do a deal. You promise not to acquire nuclear weapons and we will remove our sanctions, right? And the Iranians said, that sounds like a great deal. Uh, a few little catches. Um, we're not gonna allow really meaningful inspections, um, but if you're okay with that, then we can do the deal. The Obama administration hummed and hawed for a little while and then said, well, you know, okay, we can do that deal. And then the Iranians say, that's great, but there's this too. We'd like this extra little, you know, these particular funds released as well. And there's hemming and hawing and the Obama administration said, yeah, okay, we can do that. And so the deal, oh, and then the Iranians said, okay, we're almost there. We have one last request. We'd like the whole thing to be to sunset in phases what I mean by sunset, go away in phases over the next little, over the next several years. Some as recent, some would have already sunsetted by now, right? Except that the Trump administration withdrew the United States from the JCPOA. Um, so the Iranians, the, the Obama view was, look, we're gonna buy some time. The Iranian people will get sick and tired of these guys that are running the show. Someday they're gonna throw them out. All we have to do is prevent them from acquiring nuclear weapons until that happens. And it will happen naturally. We don't have to do it. They're just going to get fed up with the mullahs and throw them out. So it doesn't matter if, they're, if the thing sunsets. It doesn't matter if there are all kinds of loopholes in it. It's just about buying time. Okay, maybe. The other side is, well, it didn't really, there was no inspections. It sunsetted, and once it sunsetted, the Iranians were in a position to legally acquire nuclear weapons. And it didn't do anything about their exporting of terrorism. It was just focused on the nuclear file, not focused on everything else that the Iranians and the Americans disagreed about. Not only that, it scared the heck out of all of those Arab states who thought the Americans were throwing them under the bus. And so they looked around and they said, hey, Israel, you want to get on board with us? Because we have a common enemy. So inadvertently it kind of triggered that that wasn't the, the deal the question then direct to answer the question directly what happens if mr biden finds himself back uh, in well as president this time um there there were lots of noises made during the campaign that the jcpoa would be exhumed and reanimated to use a zombie metaphor um And I don't think that's technically possible, but I think the attitude, the worldview, the impulse is there, not to coerce, not to uh, sanction, not to play hardball, but to try to find um, a softer touch. And my crystal ball is no better than anybody else's. I think that if they're bringing back the people who gave us the JCPOA, 
we're likely to get JCPOA too, if the Iranians will go along with it. Um, my personal judgment is that that is a mistake. Um, the Trump administration, in my view, is like my broken clock downstairs, which is right twice a day. Uh, every now and then they got it right, and I think they got it right on Iran, um, but reasonable people can disagree about that. But I think we are likely to get more of, a, more of the Obama flavor of relations toward Iran than Trump. Okay. All right. Next question. In the past, how did the Saudis and Iran manage to coexist, or at least to get along? They've never, after 1979, they never really got along. Um, they were both more internally focused. There's a large, in the so-called Eastern province of Saudi Arabia, there's a large uh, Shia population, which looks across the Persian Gulf and says, you know, we kind of like what's going on over there. Maybe, we, you know, there's a secessionist sentiment. Um, uh, and so the Saudis have been working to tamp that down. And some of that is replicated in some of those Gulf Cooperation Council states, Bahrain, for example. And so the Saudis have been busy suppressing that at home and helping the GCC states suppress their Shia minorities, so in Bahrain's case, a majority as well. Okay. Um, but it's, it's just intensified that Iran has become more ambitious right? Uh, Iraq falls apart. Well, we, we broke it. Syria falls apart. Um, and Hezbollah and Hamas and the Iranians move into the vacuum in ways that scare the Saudis. And then the Saudis are doing things which are not scaring the Iranians, but they're irritating them, you know, um, suppressing Shia minorities in Saudi and in the Gulf Cooperation Council states. And so it's just building, it's building. And what was always in the background tamping it down from the Saudi perspective was the Americans are on our side. The Americans don't like what the Iranians are up to and they will support us. And my take is, and I'm not alone in this, but it's not unanimous either, is that um, the overtures to Iran really did make the Saudis feel very insecure. And so you get a ramping up. The intention was not to ramp up tensions, but the effect was a ramping up of tensions between the two. And it's gotta be an act of desperation. It's gotta be an act of real insecurity. If the Saudis turn to Israel and say, hey, you wanna be on the same team? I mean, you, you, that's a, something powerful is motivating the Saudis. And I think largely it's insecurity. Okay, um, a question, I think you just mentioned this glancingly, uh, but uh, this audience member picked up on it. The question is, did you say that Putin is about to retire? I, I did, I read the headline, uh, <laughs> I think just this morning. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have time, I, as I said, I taught two classes and I was kind of prepping for, for this session, um, th that he's ill, and that he's thinking about retiring. Now, I was talking to a student of mine after class today and this came up and I, we were wondering together what, what that would look like. Would he simply retire to some dasha in the middle of, you know, on some nice lake somewhere in Russia? Uh, is he really sick? You know, is like, is it terminal? Um, Whatever the case, if he leaves the scene, who's next in line and how's that going to work out? And are they going to share his vision, which is kind of, you know, uh, Russia in many objective ways is a declining power, but it's acting like it's still a superpower. And that's a, largely a function of Putin, right? You can't imagine Boris Yeltsin. Again, I can tell you guys, think back to Boris Yeltsin, right? It's hard to imagine him as a scary guy. He was, you know, drunk all the time. Um, <laughs> But, but Putin was cut from a different cloth altogether. And so, you know, if it's true, the real question is, um, nobody really cares about him, I don't think, except for his family, but, um, you know, what comes next? And who comes next? And what's that going to mean for Russian politics? Just the turmoil alone is concerning. But then once that settles down and you have a new leader, 
you know, is that leader going to be Putin 2.0 or is that going to be somebody who's less assertive? Is it going to be a more democratic arrangement? Is it, I mean, and that's just on the basis of one headline I saw. It was in the Wall Street Journal, I think. I read it this morning. Um, something to keep our eye on, though. I mean, that's that's a big development. And, and I'll just put in a little plug at this point um, uh, on the subject of Russia. If indeed uh, Putin is about to leave the scene, uh, we will have a uh, previous great uh, decision speaker, Todd Lefko, come back in um, March, I believe, uh, as part of our Tuesday Scholar series. He will be talking about uh, the uneasy coexistence of Russia and America. And no doubt, if there is a post-Putin era by that point, he will talk about that too. So that's something to look forward to. I'll so, be there for that. <laughs> okay, great. So let's go forward uh, with the questions here. Uh, have we had a role, we being the United States, uh, a role in the peace process in the Red Sea region? What might a Biden administration initiate, perhaps a return of the two-state solution? Yes, excellent question. And so the Trump administration, this is the second time my clock was right in the last <laughs> 24 hours. They did, they did in fact, um, facilitate. Now, let's not kid ourselves. The United States is not, and they don't dictate these things, but they helped. The U.S. State Department helped facilitate those discussions. Um, you will remember that the, the Trump administration moved the embassy um, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which, by the way, was a law passed by Congress under the on, in Bill Clinton's time, but never implemented. And as it was happening and before it happened, people were saying the sky will fall, the Arab street will be in flames. But it was crickets. Nothing happened, except that it seemed to convey that it was a way of the Arab capitals to communicate to Israel that they just didn't care about that, Jerusalem, the Palestinians, the two-state solution, as much as they cared about their own security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran. In my judgment, the two-state solution is dead. I was there once, one time I was in the region, it was 1998. I was there with uh, the Canadian Ministry of National Defense. I did some work for them and they sent a bunch of us on a tour of Canadian peacekeeping facilities. There's a lot of Canadian troops, Golan Heights in, in Lebanon, in, uh, in the Sinai. So we just, just toured around the region. So here's a, a bus full of guys like me. We drove through Gaza, didn't give it a second thought. Drove all through the West Bank, didn't give it a second thought. Everywhere we stopped, we talked to Israeli government officials, we talked to the PLO, we talked, everybody, I mean, they all had their issues, but everybody was optimistic that a two-state solution was just over the horizon. I wouldn't drive, personally, I would not drive through the Gaza Strip today. Um, and I bet you if I did, I wouldn't find anybody who was terribly uh, optimistic about it. And here's why. Um, the Israeli population has collectively, I think, come to the conclusion that <clears throat> they can live with the status quo. There aren't suicide bombs going off. There aren't riot. It's not like the Intifada. None of that. It's just, there's a low ambient level of discontent and maybe a little bit of violence now and then, but they can live with that. The Arab capitals, Riyadh and, uh, you know, in, in Jordan and Lebanon, um, they got their own problems and they're just not willing to prioritize the Palestinians over their own security interests. And then on the flip side, the only people supporting the Palestinians are the Iranians and that they're not your best, they're not the best friends to have at the moment in that part of the world. And then you throw in, an, in the United States under the Trump administration, which made its decision that it was going to support an international peace agreement rather than an Israeli-Palestinian. So an Israeli-Arab peace settlement of some sort with treaties and whatnot, 
rather than an Israeli-Palestinian arrangement. And for the life of me, I can't see, I, can, I think a Biden administration will try to refocus on and, re, and again, exhume the two-state solution. But I can't see it happening because the Palestinians are divided. Palestinians at this point have very few cards. Palestinians have very few patrons, none in the Arab world. In, on the international stage, the only people that seem to be fighting their corner are the, the Iranians and the left in Europe and the left, the far left in the United States. That is not, I think, a winning coalition. And I would be not surprised if a Biden administration made some gestures about reviving the two-state solution and that whole peace process. But I would be very surprised if they put much energy into it. And, and it may even be the case that once upon a time, five years ago, there was a difference between Republicans and Democrats when it came to China. Um, Democrats tended to view China as a growing power that was getting more like us. And if we just traded with them and engaged them and be nice to them, they'd be more like us and everything would be hunky dory. Nobody believes that in Washington anymore. That's gone. Everybody is more or less on the same page. They're a rising power, they're a danger, they're a threat. Uh, yeah, we trade with them a lot, but we got to be mindful of the fact that they're throwing their weight around a lot these days. And we need, it was Obama that pivoted from the Middle East to to the South China Sea, to East Asia, Indo-Pacific, as we now call it. I, there's part of me that thinks that's maybe happening with respect to the Middle East as well, that there's just not much of a constituency in American political circles to put a lot on the line for the Palestinians. Um, I might be wrong. We have a lot of Palestinian students in McAllister. You know, they're sounds trite and cliched, but they're they're wonderful people, and the thought. It, it pains me, and yet I understand the geopolitics of it as well. Okay, um, the next question. Uh, please talk about the assassination of uh, Iranian uh, General Soleimani. Yeah, so you, you guys will recall that, what was it? It must be a year ago, maybe two years now. Boy, time flies. Um, the United States caught Soleimani uh, in uniform, in, an air, in a combat aircraft, over a combat zone, and shot him down. And in certain quarters in the U.S., there was a hue and cry that he was, that this was an assassination, um, like President Anwar Sadat or Pr Prime Minister Menachem Begin were assassinated. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, as opposed to he was a casualty of war. Right? So the two ways of framing this one of which he was an enemy combatant in uniform in a combat zone. You know what happens to people like that? They get killed. And the other is, no, he was a political leader. And we don't run around assassinating prime ministers and presidents and secretaries of state. He was none of those things, by the way. He was a general um, in the Iranian um, Revolutionary Guard Corps who had a lot of blood on his hands. And so, you know, again, it broke down along predictable partisan lines, Democrats tending to decry this as a war crime and as an assassination and Republicans and especially pro-Trump Republicans um, viewing this as a no different than if you've killed an 18 year old on the beach of Iwo Jima, you know, it's just that's what happens in war, you kill people. Um, it seems in retrospect, not to have been a game changer in any way, shape or form. Um, I, I don't think either camp's concerns were borne out by subsequent reality. It seems not to have changed. There was a brief response on the streets of Tehran, some of which was anti-American, some of which was anti-Mullah, it was anti-regime and quickly went away, obviously, everything like that does in Iran. Um, but it wasn't a game changer. And when I look, look at the laws of war, it wasn't illegal. It may not have been prudential. It may not have been the smart thing to do. But I don't think it was obviously unlawful. And I don't think it was geopolitically cataclysmic. 
And for anyone who's uh, interested, uh, that uh, death took place on the 3rd of January of this year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know, I felt the same it's way. 20. <laughs> <laughs> so much has happened since then. Huh? That's okay. right, Anna so we yeah. <laughs> Our Next question, how strong is the civil unrest in Iran? It is an overthrow uh, or, uh, uh, or I guess, a removal maybe of the current regime, a possibility? Yeah, it's a possibility. Um, and there is, uh, we saw it flare up a couple of times during the Obama years, and we saw it around the Soleimani business as well. There's, there's, um, there's two kinds of discontent, one of which is ethnic. Uh, Iran is not ethnically homogenous. There are ethnic minorities, Baluchis, etc., that <laughs> never wanted to be part of the Persian Empire, never wanted to be part of Iran. Uh, they want out, and that is pretty effectively suppressed. And the other kind is a kind of political dissidence. Um, there is a very westernized, still middle class, um, which was not the natural constituency of the theocrats when they came to power. That was more of a rural, poorly educated, um, not very cosmopolitan and very uh, religious uh, part of Iranian society that they built this regime on and they've always had to find ways to contain periodic um, upsurges and dissent on the part of really the middle class. Right. Uh, the economy stinks, partly because of sanctions, partly because it's mismanaged, partly because the price of oil is just not what it was, right? It's $35 a barrel or something as opposed to $135 a barrel. So, um, so there is discontent, but the Iranian security apparatus, uh, if, if you look at the Iranian government structure, it's, it's like the old Soviet one. There are two parallel lines. There's a, uh, I'm going to simplify enormously what's complicated, but there's basically a religious official, um, a religious body that gets to determine who can run for office. There's basically the supreme leader um, is always a cleric, is always a, a, a religious figure, and he is always in position to veto everything. The Iranian Republican Guard is not part of the regular military. It reports directly to the Ayatollah. Um, there is an internal security service like the old, uh, take your pick, I mean, history is full of them, the Gestapo, the NKVD, the KGB, whatever, Stasi. Um, uh, so that discontent is always there and the possibility is always there. I haven't seen anything recently though to suggest that it's on the verge, that that regime is on the verge of changing. I, I think they've got it well in hand. Okay, the next uh, comment, it, it refers back uh, to the question about Putin and his health. Um, this person knows a little bit more and says, Putin is said to have Parkinson's disease and the news says he's leaving in January. So there you mm -hmm. have it. Um, there you have it. I, I didn't know he, he was meant to be leaving soon. So January is pretty soon. Okay. And uh, Parkinson's, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, um, we have about uh, 10 more minutes and uh, we do have room for some more questions. So if anyone in the audience has been waiting to ask your question, now is the time. Uh, meanwhile, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I'll ask a question. Um, this is uh, something of a off topic, but I think for me, and I suspect for many people in the audience, uh, seeing uh, the movie Lawrence of Arabia in our youth was a real formative experience cinematically. Yeah, yeah. Well, even then I kind of suspected that maybe the historical record wasn't exactly like that. But mm -hmm. since it made such a great impression on me and maybe a lot of other people, could you point out the worst liberties that uh, that movie took with the historical record? I think you implied that it wasn't yeah, exactly yeah. the way history went <laughs> it's, down. It's not, it's, not, it's not good history, no. It was, <laughs> it was T. Lawrence telling us a, a story, A, that made him put him in a very positive light, a kind of white savior story, right? I'm going to save the Arabs from mm -hmm. the evil Turks. There was always also, um, you know, part of Western culture is a, a powerful theme is the theme of the noble savage, 
the people who are more primitive than us, but somehow more noble and better than us, right? And so there's a lot of that, not on the Turks, they're made out to be completely evil, horrible. Uh, there's a lot of sexual stuff, as you'll recall, about yes. what happened in prison and whatnot. Um, so the Turks are portrayed from, a, from an Orientalist perspective, to use a technical term, um, in a very negative light, putting onto them all of the kind of things that we in our culture think thought at that time were bad homosexuality and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So that's all put on the Turks. And the Arabs though are made to be these noble savages that there's something just pure about them, the desert, um, none of that nonsense about city life and you know theater, uh, they're just, so there's a lot of that kind of nonsense. So it's a combination of self-serving story about how wonderful he is with a lot of cultural baggage on top of it. Um, you know, some of it was was right. The 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 basic strategy of the Arabs was to pin down the Turks in Arabia to bring them out of the Gaza Strip where the Australians and the British were trying to move toward Jerusalem. So, and cutting their supply lines. And so he got some of the details correct. Um, and it is a beautifully filmed movie. I mean, it's, if you, if you haven't seen it, it's just, it really deserved. And in a way that movies don't these days, it deserved its Oscar. <laughs> it was really good, but then as, a, and as an astute observer like you, Judy, or, or just you know, as, a, as a mere scholar, just looking at this, you know, okay, there's some weird stuff going on there. <laughs> okay. All right, next question. What will happen in Syria? It seems the country is so torn apart. Yeah, the country, like all of those countries, is very artificial in this sense. At the end of the First World War, the victorious British and the victorious French threw the defeated Turks out, and then they, made, they redrew the map according to their imperial interests, not the interests of the people on the ground. And in the war, they had promised the Arabs everything. Again, Lawrence of Arabia promised them their own states and everything else. Meanwhile, the British in the Balfour Declaration are promising the Jewish people of the world a Jewish homeland in, traditional, in the traditional uh, Judea, Samaria, Palestine. And, um, so you got these borders that were drawn by the British and the French for the British and the French. And a lot of people were caught on the wrong side of borders. A lot of mixtures of peoples within these borders. As long as they all thought they were Arab, that's one thing, but there were these religious differences. There were ethnic differences, even though Arab is kind of an ethnicity, but there was, and then nationalism took hold. So Iraqis thought they were different than Syrians and so on. Um, and Syria was not atypical. It was a very precarious political construction. It was dominated by the French. Um, they put in power a group of people, a minority called the Alawites, who weren't even recognized as Muslims until quite late in the game. The Iranians, in fact, pre-revolutionary Iranians, conferred upon them the status of kind of honorary sort of Muslims. So, but they were a tiny minority and they allied themselves with the Christian minority over and against the Sunni and Shia um, uh, people in, in, in that part of the world. And then layer on top of that, that Syria had never recognized Lebanon as an independent state. They'd always thought that it had historically been one part, it had all been part of this greater Syria thing. So, you can see now how that's putting them in conflict with their neighbors, but it's also internally a very unstable arrangement, a tiny minority, which barely qualifies as Muslim, dominating a Muslim country. And, you know, a very heavy handed person, the, the Assads, again, some of your, uh, our viewers will remember when Assad murdered 10,000 of his political opponents in a short lived uprising back in what, the 70s, late 70s. Um, so it was always very precarious. And then the Arab Spring hit. And I think people just got the bug. This is the time, right? This is the time to overthrow the tyrants in Egypt. This is the time to overthrow the tyrants in Syria. And it sort of worked. They, they sort of worked until things fell apart and in both cases. So you have the Muslim Brotherhood achieving power in Egypt and then being bumped out of power 
by a group that doesn't look that different than Hosni, Hosni Mubarak's government before the Arab rising. And then you have complete chaos, as far as I can tell, and collapse uh, in Syria. And then you have the Russians inserting themselves, and then you have American private military contractors involved, and you have the, the Iraqis involved. And I don't know how you put Humpty Dumpty back together again when it comes to the Syrian state. Um, and I don't know that there are many people other than the, other than the Alawites who want to put back together again. Um, people don't want war necessarily, although some do, but they don't want the old Syria back either. And yet the international community has a real allergy to changing borders. Because if you change borders over there, what about the people, you know, what about the Quebecois in Canada who want independence? We're going to change the borders. And you're, you're setting a precedent. And the international community has been very loath, even in Yugoslavia, very loath to uh, change borders because it just opens up a Pandora's box. So I'm not, um, I'm not bullish on, uh, on Syria for the foreseeable future, I'm afraid. Okay, I think we have time now for maybe one, maybe two questions at most. I apologize in advance to anyone whose question I am not able to get to. I'll move right on. What is the current status of Bibi Netanyahu? Well, Bibi's in, in always in political trouble um, and always in legal trouble, um, and yet always survives. Right. So not only has he survived, so he's been there's corruption charges against him and he's in a minority government. Americans don't really get that in our bones. But for parliamentary systems like Canada and Britain and Israel, uh, it's possible to put together a coalition that doesn't represent. We're getting to know this better in America. It doesn't represent the majority of votes, but it is just a, a viable coalition in parliament. Um, it's not quite like the Electoral College, but <laughs> just as frightening in some ways. Um, so he seems to have put together a coalition that has weathered some of the worst. Um, Israeli politics are very turbulent at the best of times. And then these legal challenges seems to have punted that into the future at some point. And then to cap it all off, he signs these treaties with, uh, uh, with the Gulf Cooperation Council states. Um, this guy is, uh, I was gonna say like a cockroach, but that's only in the sense that he survives no matter what, <laughs> right? He survives no matter what. <laughs> and um, I've never been all that impressed with him. I remember when he was uh, uh, ambassador to the UN for Israel. And I th remember thinking, oh, I, this guy's not my cup of tea, um, but fair dues, right? I mean, here's a guy who's stayed in power using parliamentary democratic means. He sailed a pretty close, at least he has sailed pretty close to the wind legally, and probably worse than that. Um, and then he pulls off this diplomatic coup, um, coup in the nice sense. Um, the, the guy is uh, cunning, let's leave it at that, cunning. <laughs> Okay, and on that note, I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank you very much, uh, Professor Andrew Latham. To our audience, I would say thank you, and please come back next week when we're going to have John Oswald speak on China's road to Latin America. Thank you, everyone who uh, took part in this, uh, especially our behind-the-scenes technical advisor as well. Thank you, Greg, and thank, thank you. you all. Goodbye. <laughs>